Our first speaker this morning, Mr. Umang Bedi, is a managing director at Adobe Systems for South Asia. In his role, he oversees business opportunities for Adobe. He grows the sales and marketing functions. He's driving strategic alliances and partnerships. He's expanding the channel partner ecosystem and driving cloud services opportunities for the enterprise, government, education, and SMB sectors in South Asia. He will now step forward and render our first keynote address. Good morning, Mr. Bedi. Good morning. It's over to you. Thanks. I, mean, I didn't know I did that much, by the way. Uh, but good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, you know, I was wondering how to address. I was asking RP in the morning, what's the audience in the room, and what's the Photoshop guy? You know, starting this whole session off with, is it going to really make sense? But I'm going to try and take you through uh, three parts to my session. Right. So one is going to be a very quick uh, uh, prelude into history, where we are today, and where the future of content marketing is actually headed. Uh, and it's it's pretty interesting. And you know, the, the years and the timelines may change. But we're pretty certain that the trends that we are seeing are going to lead us in that direction. The second part of my, uh, of my discussion is going to be to dispel three myths. Uh, and I really like this part. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about content marketing from my perspective, using a real world example of how a brand reached out to me uh, and converted me as a customer. And I thought that was really innovative uh, and very, very smartly done. Um, so without further ado, well, let me just start off. You know, if you think about the world that we're living in, whether you call us content marketers, I, I firstly was introduced to this term by RP itself. I was like, what is content marketing? How does it differ from digital marketing? But I'm going to use content and digital uh, you know, loosely together, because I think all the content that we're creating in, good old, in the good old days went into print, went into television, and increasingly, all of that is going online. Uh, all of that is going digital, it's going into tablets, it's going into mobile devices. So if you think about the world around us, uh, you know, the content marketing or digital marketing is moving really, really fast. It's getting more and more sophisticated. And it's not that we're being asked to do, uh, you know, more with less. We can deal with that. We're being asked to do more with more. More content, more data, more audiences, more segments, more tools, more technology, more tablets, more devices, more pressure. And very often, uh, you know, we, we find ourselves reading books like Digital for Dummies, Unleashing the Twitter Sphere. In my own case, I'm writing my seminal masterpiece which says, does this data and content make me look big? Uh, saw grapes, you know, it's not the content that makes me look big anyways. But, but nonetheless, I think uh, the answers to, uh, to any, if any technology vendor were to stand up here and say he or she has the answer, any agency, they're bullshitting you, right? It's complete BS. Uh, I think the answers are in the journeys, and the journeys are in this room. And I think it's going to be a really interesting conference to hear perspectives from various people in various parts of the globe. It's nice to see people coming in, not only from India, but from different parts of Asia as well. Uh, to be a part of the summit. So very quickly, uh, I'm going to take you through what I believe is uh, the future of content marketing. Uh, just start off with a question, just to you know, warm you up. Which of these brands existed in 2003? Just you know, go for it. There's Tivio, there's Facebook, um, iPhone, Pandora, which is a music streaming service, Gmail. Right? Come on, guys, wake up. Which of these brands existed in 2003? So there's one smart man in the room, right? Uh, it's, it's actually TiVo. Uh, TiVo for is, for a, you know, as a crude definition, is a, is a streaming service, so is a video uh, service by which you could pause programming and fast forward advertising. But just think about it. Facebook came in 2004, Gmail at around the same time, Pandora a year later, and iPhone in 2007. The brands. These brands today are a part of our lives. They didn't exist 10 years ago, right? So what, what that's trying to tell us is the world is changing. If you think about what we saw in 2003 to 2006, uh, you saw Google getting launched with its IPO. It really became a real business around that time. Uh, Facebook was launched, YouTube, Twitter. But interestingly, there was an explosion. Uh, and there was an explosion of data in the form of text messaging. I don't know if you remember how much of text we all started sending each other. It became a new way. Uh, to communicate. You know, where in 2006 to 2009, around that same time, smartphones came out. Actually, the first smartphone came out in 2001. Uh, it was a Palm Pilot uh, kind of a phone enabled by Kyocera. And I remember buying my first smartphone in 2004. It was an O2 XDA. Uh, it was neither smart, it was neither a phone, trust me. It, it used to hang all the time. <laughs> but you know, a lot of this stuff, iPhone came out in 2007 and really changed the game. I think it changed the way 
uh, people started dealing with a smarter device. And then there was convergence, right? You had uh, phones being used for no more than just telecommunications, but you had content being consumed uh, on that as well. Uh, around the same time, interestingly, in the Western countries, data usage uh, actually surpassed the usage of voice on the internet. Uh, between 2010 to 2012, I think that's where you saw iPad and Instagram come out, right? I mean, with the iPad, for, for the first time, content marketers were seeing how people were engaging with content. They were touching and feeling it, right? And uh, interestingly, GE and other companies invested in the Internet of Things, you know, where all devices were connected to the Internet. And uh, uh, Brainwave or neuromarketing, which is a science, uh, came out in the US. You know, they put a sensor on your, on your head and they expose you to a brand or a concept and see how you're reacting to it. So new changes started emerging. Where we are today, I think it's pretty, pretty obvious, right? We're in, a, we're in an omni-channel world. Uh, we're engaging with brands, we're engaging with content uh, across different platforms, both in the online and the offline world. You know, you may, you may research content online, you may make the purchase online. Uh, a lot of times you're researching offline, but you're buying it online, uh, you know, which is a concept called showrooming which has got really, really popular in the US, uh, which is why you know, hard brick and mortar retail is really suffering. But it, more often than not, if you think about how you deal with your bank or how you deal with your service provider, it is a truly omni-channel world. So this was the past and where we are today. Let's take a look into where we are headed, right? So uh, just before we go there, one phenomena which I think we're all aware of, and I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, is while all of this is happening, there is a deluge of data, right? Data is just expanding. By the time this conference is over, it'd be interesting to see how many tweets come out of this conference itself, you know? Maybe over 100,000. Uh, you look at the amount of, uh, by, the, this, by the end of this month, there'll be more than two billion people watching videos on YouTube. So whenever you think about content, the way I describe it is, data is what is actually connecting the dots. It's one side of the coin. The other side of it is content. Content is expressive, it's monumental, it inspires action, but Data is what actually is the enabler that can amplify the relevance of that content. And with the example that I'll share with you towards the end of the session, you'll actually see how this brand married data and content, uh, both in the offline and online world, to create a really contextual, engaging experience for a customer. As we go forward, you know, the years may change, but we, we believe by 2018 to 2022, three phenomena will occur. First, everything would be connected to the internet, right? Uh, everything would be connected. Today you have devices like Fitbit and the Nike Fuel Band that tell you more about your body than you know about it themselves, right? And you're gonna see this happening. You won't need to check into the hotel like Githika just did. You would walk into a store, there would be towers, you know, which would be uh, tracking where you go. Devices would give you the, con if you walk into a retail store, bases your profile, the, the content that you see from there, would be relevant and socially connected to you to what makes relevant sense. There's gonna be a explosion of data, and contrary to what I said before, uh, there would be, devices will soon disappear, right? You would have content available to you on any platform uh, at any given point of time. And I think as, as this goes forward, what we expect to happen is by around 2023, uh, you're gonna have consumers telling you that we wanna consume that content absolutely anywhere. It has to be contextually relevant. It could be on the dashboard of a car. It could be on a screen. You're seeing Google come up with projects like Google Glasses, which is taking up. IBM's coming up with the, uh, with the speech web. So all of this is slowly moving to becoming a reality, right? And that's what I expect uh, to happen in the future. So, uh, so you, when you think about our role as marketeers or as content marketeers or digital marketeers, you know, what can content marketeers do today to prepare for this world that's coming in the future? I think that's, that's the key question that we need to be asking ourselves. But I'll, I'll just switch over uh, on a lighter note. You know, when I travel across uh, India and the Asia region and I meet CEOs, CFOs, CIOs, uh, and different uh, people in the room, the, the, the feedback that I get is, you know, marketing is BS. Uh, and, I can see sniggers and people smiling. You know, people tell me it's fluffy, it, it is, uh, you know, it's not data driven, you know, the CMO puts up an ad out there and the PVC clicks uh, and, you know, he becomes a hero. It's almost like comparing the goalkeeper's job versus the center forward who it's one strike on goal uh, and, you know, he becomes a hero overnight. So 
it, it is this myth, but if you think about uh, some of the research that's out there, so Foreigners Group basically took out this report that 70% of the CEOs that they interviewed believe that marketeers are disconnected from real world business results. And that is the truth. As, as practitioners in this room, if you talk to your peers on the other side, that's what they actually think of us. And trust me, that's not, uh, it's, it's not uncommon even within Adobe. It's, it's the same thing, right? It's fluffy and you know, we're, we're full of gas. Uh, however, if you think about how the world is now moving to digital, everything can be measured. Today, I think marketers are at a vantage point, right? Uh, you have the ability to, to measure, to listen to the voice of your customer, to know what's happening with your brand faster than anyone else. So in my view, this is all baloney and hogwash, right? I believe marketing is the new finance. Uh, that's the way I look at it, right? Today, you are in a position uh, to actually dictate strategy into your company because you have a pulse of what's happening with your consumer brand. The other thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, just moving forward on this topic is, and this is just one more myth you know, that often comes up. Uh, in my view, uh, and I talk to customers all over, all commerce is e-commerce, right? Now this is a controversial statement. If you Google how much commerce happens online today or in digital channels today, it will tell you it's 5%. Uh, Forrester believes that'll grow to about 10% in 2014. E-marketer is a little more bullish. It says it's 15%. But I think the whole challenge is it's a classic problem of attribution. Right? When you think about how you're engaging with content and how you're engaging with a brand, you could be clicking, swiping, sharing, tagging, chatting uh, you know, online. You could be researching content. It's that whole showrooming concept, right? Uh, it's what you attribute the sale to. When I talk to physical world retailers, and if you're a brand who's retailing in the physical world, uh, I keep telling them that even the commerce that's happening at their store today is digital. At the end of the day, that that system is connected to a point of sales device, which is then connected to an inventory management system, which is connected to a supply chain system, right? So all commerce, if you can get that, that all commerce is gonna get e-enabled, even if it's via showrooming online or via research that's done online and people are purchasing offline, that's an important myth to dispel. The, the other thing that I wanted to talk to you about is this whole concept of real-time marketing. And I don't know how many people have heard this term, I think everyone has. But it's constantly uh, you know, used and abused in different formats. And that's the third myth that I wanted to talk to you about. You know, at Adobe, we introduced this concept called the last millisecond. I'll just introduce to you what this is. So when you, think about, um, when you think about every action that you take uh, online, whether you're swiping, you're tagging, you're pinning, you're chatting, or you are clicking, or you're just doing a search query, or you're chatting, uh, at that point of time, basis your action and the input that you receive from the brand, that touch point is an, is an opportunity for the brand to deliver a personalized, meaningful you know, experience. If you think about commerce today, it's just a price war. It's not about you know, building long-term uh, customer value, and that could only happen if you can build meaningful experiences. Think about it, right? A monk goes and climbs a mountain. He doesn't do it because he just wants to, it's meaningful. So if you want to build long-term value, it's about building that meaningful experience with the brand. Now, if you can guess, I mean, I'll give a prize to whoever can guess, what's the time between an action that you take in the digital world, it could be online, it could be on a kiosk, it could be on a plane, the action that you take and the experience that you serve back. How much time do you think that is? Right? Wild guess. Sorry? It's about 300 milliseconds, right? Uh, so in 300 milliseconds, you have to know who that guy is, where is he coming from, or who that girl is, what is the context of uh, his request or what he wants to search for, and at the same time deliver an experience that is tailored uh, and personalized uh, to, to something that he or she has requested for. Imagine doing, you know, there are lots of women in the room, but just imagine doing a, a search on uh, black leather bags and you get taken to a website where after seven clicks you gotta go and find a black leather bag. Uh, that's not the experience that you're looking for. You drop off by then, right? So how do you deliver that contextual experience in real time in 300 milliseconds is, is the real challenge, right? And that is uh, what we call the last millisecond. So I'll pause here, but I'm gonna switch gears to the last part of my presentation. I thought I'll keep this brief uh, and talk to you about how a brand 
uh, in, in real life today dealt with me and you know, used some of these principles uh, to really tailor a, a contextual and a meaningful experience in the last millisecond. So there are going to, there are going to be four things that I'm going to talk to you about, which I've seen successful brands do really well. Uh, they're built on four pillars. The first is listen, the second is predict, the third is assemble, and the fourth is deliver. Right? And I'm going to talk to you about my experience with the Harley-Davidson brand. Uh, so I'm proud owner uh, of a Harley-Davidson motorcycle. It, it is a universally appealing brand, at least to the men in this room, hopefully. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not addressing the, uh, the pretty agenda, but, uh, and maybe some of the girls are also bike enthusiasts, but you know, I, I love that brand, I love that bike. And I'll just talk to you about my entire journey of, which just happened recently, about how the Harley brand engaged with me. And this will kind of marry the two concepts that, I've been, that I introduced. One is around content, uh, the other is around data, and how that can be married together to provide a contextual experience. So what the Harley brand did really well was it listened, right? And when I say it listened, it just tried to see who I was and what was I doing online. Whether I was coming to their website, filling in a form for a test drive, calling up their call center, giving my details and telling them, send the bike home for a test drive. They were just looking at what is this guy doing, right? The second thing that they did is that they had a lot of non-personally identifiable information about me, right? Where I'm coming from, you can track gender today, you can track IP address, you can track demographic information. Uh, and they, at times, when I logged into their site, I came in from a Facebook connect. So they had a lot of information about me, right? My likes, my dislikes, my friends. I could come in from a search query, I could come in from Twitter. So they were just listening. And what they were doing very intelligently was building a profile about what is this guy doing? What's Umang doing on my website? You know, what is the information that he's looking for? And for that, you need to have systems in place that have the capability of measuring every single click, every single swipe, every single tag, every single pin in real time, right? And then you have to have the ability to marry that data with your offline data. So I may have called their call center, or I may have walked into a store and you know, filled up a form of interest to uh, join a, uh, you know, a biking event that they were doing. So you have the ability to marry that information and create a persona. They may not know I'm among Bedi till then, unless I come in through a Facebook Connect and log in, but they know who I am in terms of a persona. The second thing that they did, which I thought was brilliant, was predict, right? Now, uh, I'm a sucker for the bike, but I'm also an Indian at the end of the day. I, I want a deal, right? I'm not gonna pay crazy money for it. Uh, I want it cheaper than what it really is. So I'm, I'm truly not interested in the latest and the greatest model of the Harley Davidson. If you give me an old model with a 20 or 30% discount, I, you know, and throw in a few freebies, I'm more than happy. Now, how did they do that? They did that because they had predictive technology to see what were the kinds of information I was looking at on their Facebook page. Which models was, what I was, was I observing on my, uh, on, their, on their website. And they did this by analyzing my behavior and seeing what kind, of a, what kind of content can I serve to this guy to inspire him or seduce him to click and convert, right? And that was something which I found, again, very meaningful. The third thing that they did was assemble. And that's where, you know, I'm, I'm moving to the more traditional side of Adobe's business on the creative content side where you create content that's compelling. So they understood that, basis my profile, I was looking for an older model of a bike, right? And they also understood, basis my profile on my Facebook page, that I love golf. So I was browsing a golf magazine. They had a partnership with that mag, well, you know, browsing that thing online. And within that experience on ESPN Golf, they served me a contextual offer, which told me that 2013 models of bikes come at a cheaper rate, right? And I wasn't aware of it, they were running a promotion. But now, the promotion is relevant. It's relevant because they had the ability to listen, they know who I am at a very broad level, they understand what my pre preferences are, they've predicted what would convert that offer, and in real time, this is the trick, right? Can you assemble creative assets and serve it on your Facebook page, on your partner's page, on an affiliate's page, which is the example that I made here, and serve me that experience? Right? And finally, uh, another important point uh, that I would like to raise is the delivery part of it. Right? Now, I could have come to that website or that affiliate site 
through a tablet, through a handheld device, through a smartphone, through a kiosk. Today there are over 18,500 known devices with over 10,000 form factors, right? I was telling Abhiman, you were sitting on my table when, before this meeting, that if I take a picture of you and I put it on your website, right, and somebody has to access that image on any freaking device, how do you, how do you determine that that image is going to look the same or that content's going to look as appealing and as contextually appealing on those devices? So the delivery, today you have technology that is capable of taking that content and creating 18,000 renditions of it for any single device known to mankind, right? And delivering it by understanding what's the end user platform that you're coming in from. So that the experience that you have, whether you go online, whether you go offline, the brand's experience is actually really, really consistent. Uh, and that's what actually you know, led me to their store, made a sale, and now I'm a proud owner. So it was basically four steps, right? Listen, predict, assemble, and deliver in the last millisecond, which is in 300 milliseconds. And to me, that's where content marketing is headed. It's not only about creating compelling content, but it's about delivering that content contextually to create that meaningful experience that seduces a consumer, or induces a reaction from a consumer to go to the next step, whether it's a purchase or whether it's a like on a Facebook page or whatever you're trying to do as your end user goals, right? So uh, with that, I think I'm, I'm almost at the end of time, uh, but what I'm gonna try and leave you with is what we're doing in this space. So what Adobe has done is, you know us for our creative technology. You know, all of you have used our tools to create content, whether online, whether it's on the web, whether it's video, whether it's for print, right? We've taken that entire business into the cloud, and that's what we've called our creative cloud platform. And we've built the largest digital marketing business on the planet. So today, we, whatever I described, we do this for about 15,000 brands globally, from a Citibank to a Make My Trip to a Flipkart to anyone who's serious about his online business, about 15,000 global brands. We measure about 40 trillion transactions a year for these brands in terms of real-time analytics and have about $4 billion of advertising spend move through our platform. So that's what we do as a, uh, as a business. But lastly, if I could just leave you with three things, right? Uh, while the listen, predict, assemble, and deliver uh, content in real time or in the last millisecond is more at a pr practitioner level, if you have to get started, what do you do, right? So these are my three takeaways that I'd leave you with. The first one is engage everywhere. You gotta be thinking about taking that content and engaging whether it's on social, whether it's on search, whether it's in print, whether it's on television, you've got to be have, you've got to have a mechanism to engage everywhere. If you don't, trust me, your competitor will, right? Or if you're an agency and you're working with uh, a brand, you can be rest assured that their competitive brand would. You've got to have the ability to take that content and engage on every single platform where you think your target audience is going to be engaging with you. The second is a no-brainer. You've got to embrace rocket science, right? I'm going to ask a show of hands in this room, and I've done this five times before. How many people, if you're an agency or a brand, measure everything that's happening on your website or your mobile site? When I say everything, I mean every single transaction, every single click. I don't mean segments. I know customers do it all the time using segments. How many people do measure every single transaction? None. Right? That's how scary this is. So you've got to start embracing it at some point of time. Because if you want to have the capability to deliver that contextual experience, you've got to move away from audience segmentation. It's dead. It's completely dead, right? Uh, and that's, that's something that you need to do. And third is my last point, which is connect the dots, right? If you can marry that data and content, you're going to be able to deliver that experience, which is a real wow for a customer, uh, and you know, manage to get uh, and improve in whatever metric you're trying to track. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the end of my presentation. I try to make it quick and uh, short, uh, and I'm happy to take questions right now. I know I may have five minutes left, but I'm trying to give back time. I promised RP that I'll uh, try and speed it up from my side so that I don't take that much time. And I know this was probably a little different from what you expected it to be, but I just thought of sharing this example because it was really, really cool to see how uh, the Harley brand actually you know, took these principles in various aspects. And it's not technology only from Adobe. They've used all kinds of stuff, right? So it's not that they're a customer and I'm trying to position it there. They just use some of these principles really effectively uh, to drive conversion. So 
Uh, I'll pause there and thank you so much for your time. You've been very patient. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much. <laughs> Are there any questions or? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Gurmeet. Uh, the question I wanted to ask is uh, when you say, uh, you, you know, the data uh, connection, connectivity, basically, uh, you, know, you know, the data getting uh, populated on over uh, uh, 18,500 different kind of handsets. So I come from a background where we, uh, um, uh, you, you know, produce content for uh, various, various telecom operators and uh, it's, it's populated across all operators. So, uh, I, I, uh, for example, I recently I was, uh, so when we look at uh, India as a, a rural India, so uh, the connectivity is an always an issue. How do you, how do you see the, recently somebody has asked me a very uh, 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 important question from his point of view. Uh, it, it was a rural school, one of the upcoming schools uh, promoted by a, 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 a pretty known gentleman in the country. Sure. And, uh, he asked me, uh, they asked me one thing, uh, okay, you are uh, putting our uh, data on the cloud, but uh, how do you assure, and how do you assure the connectivity part of it? Yeah, you know, so, so so, it, sure. let me answer it in two or three ways, right? So I think the question that the gentleman asked is, uh, if everything is moving digital and everything is moving to the cloud, there are, is still an infrastructure gap, at least in this country, right? I always tell uh, people who come here, there are Indias within India, right? Mm -hmm. So still 60% of India lives in a rural area. That's what the question was. If I'm targeting content towards rural, uh, how would I do it, right? And sometimes connectivity is an issue. So, you know, I can't solve for connectivity. I'm not a telecom operator. But what I can tell you is that uh, the connectivity is getting better. Uh, in urban India, you see 4G getting launched and Reliance is gonna come up in a very, very big way with their geo project. However, for rural, some of the brands that I've worked with, I can tell you what they do. Uh, they don't use very heavy content marketing into rural because they understand that you know, it's difficult to deliver that content on the kind of connectivity that exists there, except the state of Gujarat, which I think is rocking. Whatever your, your views are on the politics of Narendra Modi, I don't care about it, uh, but go to that state. Adobe is there in 28,000 villages. That connectivity rocks, absolutely rocks, right? So I don't know which state you're referring to, but let's assume Assume that you're referring to a state which has terrible connectivity. Then I've, what I've seen brands do, and I've seen Hindustan Levers do that very effectively. I've seen uh, Reuters Market Light do that very effectively, and I've seen Intuit, which I was leading uh, in my previous job, do that effectively, is use text messaging, right? So instead of delivering creative content, it's more of creative messaging. So you're adapting that platform. So if the, if the, if the link is weak, you have the ability to just take the creative and deliver it into a handphone device. Because every farmer today, everyone in a rural village is carrying a, a handphone. You'll be surprised, right? And I personally visited these villages, so I can tell you that. Uh, they are carrying a phone. So if you can start tailoring, I'll give you an example, okay? So we were doing a test on uh, sending information to a farmer about his crops and about which nearest mandi he should go and sell his crops. I don't know if you know, but there's a big problem in India where you farmers create, uh, grow crops, but they, they don't know where to sell it. And the middleman in the middle probably earns more than all of us collectively put together in this room, right? There's that much money involved. And that's why you have farmer suicides and all of that stuff. So we created a platform to say, hey, Mr. Farmer, we know what you're growing. This is the time of your harvest. Go to these four Mondays, and this is the approximate rate of tomatoes, if that's what the uh, crop he was selling. And we were trying to understand, does the farmer even read this message, right? Does he even open it up? Does he even understand it? Does he act upon it? Because we couldn't become an exchange. If we became an exchange, I had to guarantee a rural transaction. No way in hell would I be allowed to do that by my company. So what we did is we put in an offer towards the end that said uh, five rupees off or 10 rupees off of Santur Shikhakai soap. You know, sandalwood soap is very popular in the village. And you'd be surprised, and that guy had to go to the Tirana shop to go and claim that offer. You'd be surprised in the test that we ran in Gujarat, and I'm giving the Gujarat example here, we almost had a 75% conversion rate, right? Because of that offer. So it was contextual. And I'm just giving you a, you know, maybe a, an offset example, but I'm giving you my experiences. 
Uh, so I've seen rural definitely go for less, less content heavy uh, applications or images, use more of text to deliver that content. Unless you have an offline network that you can create uh, to serve, let's say, a school in that village, uh, which if you have a way of hosting a server or something out there. But that's the way I would frame it. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm anyway available offline, so we can always have a chat. But great talking to you. Thanks so much for your time, and you've been really patient. Really. Thank you, Mr. Baby. We'd like to thank you with a memento. Mr. R.P. Singh will do the honors. Please stay with me here on the dais. Thank you for your time and your participation.